Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at telerik.com slash platform. That's telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 493. In this episode, Scott talks with Jacob Crawl from Fog Creek Software about using the C-Sharp Roslyn compiler to bring their older language, called Wasabi, up to date. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm talking to Jacob Crawl from Fog Creek Software. How are you? Doing all right. How are you, Scott? I am pretty fabulous, and I like talking to people who are solving big technical problems with open source software. And uh, you all did something really cool with Roslyn, but I think we need to back up 15 years to really understand the context. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Can't just start right at the end of the project, which was killing our compiler, Wasabi. You really have to start back in uh, about 2003 when Fog Creek Software had its first intern program. Um, we had an intern... We call him Jimmy, because that's really close to his name. And Jimmy knew Java, so... Jimmy knew Java. I think that was a book I read to one of my children. (laughs) I bet it was, yeah. I forget how that one ends, though. (laughs) But we had Fogbugs, which is a pretty successful bug tracker. Um, In 2003, we were doing great, uh, selling lots of software to Windows customers. Uh, It was written in VBScript, which is the ASP server-side language uh, of the time. It was advanced for 2000 which is when Fogbugs was first started. And we wanted to sell to customers who, for whatever reason, didn't have Windows on their servers. So we had Jimmy write a sort of half-baked compiler. It was it was a little bit stronger than just using regular expressions or something to translate from VBScript to PHP, but it wasn't like a full-strength industrial compiler or anything. Was it a, it was, forgive my my uh, nit, but is it a compiler or a transpiler? Like, is it translating from one language to another, or is it legitimately compiling? Well, I think a transpiler, this is something we debated about on Hacker News, um, a lot of us nerds on there. Uh, a transpiler is actually a strict subset of compilers. So all transpilers mm-hmm. are compilers, but not all compilers are transpilers. I did not know that. Yeah, the the difference between a transpiler and other kinds of compilers is only in what kind of generation phase it has. It still has a generation phase, so it still qualifies mm-hmm. as a compiler. Hmm. Um, but are there there are things are there things out there in the world that people call compilers, and it's just like I hacked a bunch of stuff together to work. Yeah, I mean, but this all was a legit is kind of that way. But, but yeah, you know what I'm saying, though. But this was like this wasn't this was a wasn't just like regular. Like he built an an abstract syntax tree, and like it was really intending to compile this stuff. Right. Yeah, it. that that was the eventual goal for it. But he had three months, and he knew Java, and you know, it wasn't like a huge general purpose programming language. It, was, it had one job: it was to turn Fogbugs from a VBScript app to a VBScript app that also ran on the PHP runtime. Mm-hmm. So he didn't have to do anything with like the math library or, you know, all these fancy things that VBScript can do. He just had to translate the parts that already had the same sort of thing happening in PHP. He just had to figure out which library function to call. Mm -hmm. Instead of response.write, it would do print or whatever and things like that. And its job was to make fog bugs run, not to make any general purpose application run. Exactly. Yeah, it, was, it had exactly one program that would ever run through it. So he could do all sorts of things, throw away all sorts of data that nobody else would blame us for doing because it just wasn't necessary for the process. Which is really and, nice because when you do something that's single task like that, like it makes your job a lot easier. It's just like very, it's very understood and finite. Here is the code that you have to translate. That is the sum total of everything that Fogbugs is. Yeah. And that's been one of my favorite parts about working on Wasabi is that you can get away with some stuff like, um, not having 
really general purpose features and just having really, really specific things to say, well, we know that Fogbugs never has a piece of code like this. So I'm just not going to write, you know, the code that generates console applications. It's just not even in there. You can't have a main function. It has to, it has to be a library, basically. Um, so what happened? Jimmy tool, worked on this for a while and then yeah. it became something more. Did Jimmy leave? Yeah, Jimmy was an intern for the summer, um, and he left, and I think he's working in some global credit organization or something like that now, um, making tons of money. And um, when all was said and done, we probably would estimate it at like 20% of the effort for Fogbugs 4, including all of the runtime work and all the things our full-time engineers did to get it out there and get an installer and all that sort of stuff for our non-Windows customers. And it brought in an additional, let's say, about ten percent of sales, just on top of what we were already making. So, that's so then you've cool. so you've got a uh, a compiler. It's written mm-hmm. in Java, mm-hmm. and it takes VB Script that was even written before two thousand and three, like mm-hmm. well, in nineteen ninety five. Turns it into <laughs> you know it's a tokenizer, it's a parser, it's a finite state machine. It turns it into PHP, and now mm-hmm. it can run. Fog bugs without a rewrite of fog bugs runs right. it on yeah. Windows and Unix, and now there's a non-trivial number of people running your product on Unix, and they are happy. Yeah, we had 10% growth by basically just porting with mm-hmm. a little compiler that an intern wrote in a summer. Okay, and then this goes on for a while, um, and uh, fog. This becomes fog basic is the thing that becomes yeah. wasabi. At this point, is it no longer VB script? It is its own thing. You have basically taken the language and kind of run off in another direction with it. Right. So the tool Jimmy wrote was called Thistle. And then around 2005, so maybe two and a half years after that internship, we wanted um, our new developer, Stefan Rusek, he wanted to add automated testing to fog bugs because, you know, that's something you want when you're writing software. So it only took us five years to get to that point. Um and he wanted to know how much code coverage we had. And VB script is not a language that's particularly good at instrumentation and that sort of thing. So he added a new backend to Thistle, which was to generate VB script from the VB script. <laughs> Why? Okay. And one thing he did in that generation step was he added the instrumentation code he needed. So every function definition had a little header at the top that said, you know, increment some variable and start a timer. And then at the nice. bottom of the function, it would have the, the uh, end of that instrumentation. So then you've got aspect-oriented programming inside of Wasabi. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can do arbitrary things. We didn't do too many fancy things at that point. Basically, it was just to say how, how good's our code coverage because it's not like C sharp or Java where you can just ask the runtime was this line of code called or not because it doesn't know. It's not. It's old. Mm-hmm. So then at this point, you're generating classic ASP, you're generating mm-hmm. PHP, mm-hmm. JavaScript is probably coming along. Are you starting to generate JavaScript as well? That was kind of the next step. So the first thing we did was we added features. So we were still writing VB script, but we were writing VB script where you didn't have to declare your variable and give it its initial assignment on the different lines. So we added that feature, you know, pretty early on. I think I was an intern in 2006. I think I was the one that got really mad and requested that feature. I said, why do I have to say dim x, new line, x equals five? Um, and we added do while loops instead of these really old school basic loops and for each and stuff like that. So they're kind of simple syntactic features that were just sugar on top of the language. Um, Stefan also added lambdas. So closures, basically first class functions um, to the language. And at that point, we've got a new language. And we need to give it a name. So my intern class had a naming competition. Uh, there were names like Coral and uh, some other kind of gemstone because Ruby was getting really popular. We wanted to rip off that name. Um, and then Wasabi was one because we had sushi for lunch that day in the office. And Bone Crusher 3000, which was suggested by uh, Eric Goldman, who's now at uh, I think he's at Dropbox, but he went to Facebook after Fog Creek. And Bone Crusher 3000 won because it's awesome. Um, but the full time engineer, Stefan, uh, basically said, we can't call it that, even though it'd be awesome to type BC3K every time you're compiling it. Um, the second place runner up actually 
became the name of the language, which was Wasabi. Okay. So at, at any point here, and forgive me, my job is to ask ignorant questions, but at any point, why didn't you just write the app over again in PHP or some language that is cross-platform and just leave it at that? Why play the compiler, make your own language game? That's a good question. Um, I think at that point, it was still kind of uncertain if there was a language that fit that need. Because the thing we liked about shipping VB script to our customers is that we would just ship source code in our installer and a little script that would bring up their database. We didn't have to install some huge funky runtime that wasn't part of their base Windows system. Oh, I see. So Windows people are 90% of your audience, so mm -hmm. that bringing PHP over, bringing Python over is bringing a big funky runtime. Yeah, and they're kind of weird flavored to Windows developers. Like you say PHP in 2005, and the Windows mm -hmm. people say, I don't know, I heard bad things about that. I've heard, you know, it's got huge security holes and blah, blah, blah. Right. It was a different world. And certainly PHP and, and even Rails, I mean, they can run fine on Windows. Today, yeah. Today. But yeah, this was 10 years ago. This was 10 years ago. And I mean, there's still things that don't run well on Windows. And that's something you have to be careful of if you want right. to Right. There's pathing Windows. issues. And uh, I've got a great PHP app that runs on Windows. But every once in a while, the guy that writes it will uh, do something wrong with like backslash versus forward slash. Yeah. Because and, he forgets. And, and something will break. Because it, it's, I think uh, Joel Spolsky says it's like Japan versus the United States. We eat sushi and they eat hamburgers. But your default state is like Japanese people learn how to eat with chopsticks and American people learn how to eat with a fork and a knife. And you can you can learn the other kind of as you get older, but it's still not your native yeah. language. That's kind of a thing with Linux. And I thought you were going to say that we just shove it into our face with our hands, but I'm, I'm with you at the fork. Well, that's the correct well. way to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Both sushi and hamburgers, but um, yeah. yeah. Well, my wife's father eats a hamburger with a knife and fork, but that's a whole other podcast. Mm. Yeah, believe me. Um, <laughs> okay, so you've got wasabi, mm -hmm. and uh, it's starting to get. Uh, it's getting so big that you have to document it and like write a book about it. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, and, yeah. uh, this is getting complicated. At the same time, though, .NET is starting to really take, take hold and C Sharp 2.0 is coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to one thing you said. You said that you thought maybe there was a JavaScript backend. Oh, yes. And, um, that was the time we almost made Node.js. So we had this idea over lunch one day that it was really annoying that you had to use two different languages to do web development. So there's, no matter what you do, there's two different languages. It's, it sure felt like that, at least at the time. So on the server, we were doing Wasabi, and we had a compiler. And we thought, I don't know, why don't we just have Wasabi compile to both? And this let us do all sorts of really cool things for 2006, like have one piece of code generate a piece of UI. And then that same piece of code could be called uh, with an AJAX call mm -hmm. and get an update to that without having to request HTML from the server. So right. if you if you just had a piece of data, it could re-render itself using the same code, just generated in a different way. And everybody was poking at that problem in from different directions mm -hmm. around, you know, 2005, 6, 7, trying to yeah. figure out, like there was script, script sharp and, you know, these different things where it's like, gosh, I've got this little runtime on the client. Yeah. I've got this pretty good runtime on the back end. They really should work together more and we yeah. should abstract that away. And we had web forms and update panels and all these different attempts to abstract away things. But it seems like the impedance mismatch was so great that, and the JavaScript of 2006 wasn't really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was just about when JavaScript, the good parts came out. So before that, we didn't know it had good parts. <laughs> we were just using all of them kind of equally. Yeah. Like the only thing that worked cross browser was apparently pop unders. <laughs> yeah, because those were everywhere, right? right? And the alert dial, like, like that was like, I, I could make alert work reliably, mm -hmm. but nothing else, you know, yeah. DOM access, no, unacceptable. No, because it was, it was like slightly different on every browser was mm -hmm. the way to access the inner text of a node or something was different in Mozilla versus Internet Explorer. 6. So did you succeed in making JavaScript? Um, yeah, I mean, we were generating JavaScript reliably. Um, the, problem ended up being that nobody actually wants to write wasabi code everybody just wants to write javascript and then do the same thing on the server so that's why node is out there and wasabi is mm -hmm. 
one eighth open source and the rest of it is in the trash can. So at some point, someone must have thought that maybe we, fog bugs should stop depending on Wasabi and want to remove it, right? Yeah, that happened several times. Um, we had um, a try in 2001 called uh, Project Soy Sauce, I think. 2011. 2011, that's correct. Yeah. Um, Ted, Ted Yu, was, he's, he's now on one of the BSD teams, uh, and I'm going to insult him by not remembering which one. I'm sorry. Um, his idea was to take the Fogbugs code compiled with Wasabi, which is now .NET at this point. That's when I joined the Wasabi team. Was we rewrote the entire backend. Um, so instead of generating PHP and VBScript and JavaScript, we generated a .NET DLL and then just run that on Mono or in mm-hmm. IIS. Which is still interesting to me because you are writing a new compiler to generate take Wasabi, which is the the core intellectual property. Uh, Wasabi is the thing that describes the intent that is fog bugs, mm-hmm. and rather than just writing it in C sharp mm-hmm. from scratch and like writing the new app, you wrote another. You you picked a new target and now you generate C sharp. Yeah, and. You know, every time that happened, it was the sensible thing to do at the time because it was slightly less work, slightly less risk. Mm. And we have. Because the Wasabi did express the intent correctly. Yeah, exactly. And I had all the comments and it would just be, you know, the the tools of the time just weren't quite there Mm -hmm. to get us exactly the meaning out of the code that was written. Instead, it was like Ted's project, Project Soy Sauce, which was to take the .NET assembly open it in .NET Reflector, export that to a C-sharp project, mm-hmm. apply regular expressions. Uh, and you had then, me right up until that part, right? Yeah, well, he called it soy sauce, but that was kind of the magic, you know, Perl script he was going to use to translate it from this really janky C-sharp output into professional-looking idiomatic C-sharp. Oof. And then the wow. last bullet point on the list is uh, drink lemonade. <laughs> but the the idea that you're using regular expressions to do this and not like the code DOM, mm-hmm. yeah. Is so disturbing. I think I think he didn't want to work with that because it was just such a not easy to use API. You were basically right. if you wanted to do anything that was outside the design of Microsoft Code DOM, mm-hmm. you were basically generating strings with the code that you meant to generate, and it just it right. wasn't perfect. Well, and you've got. Um, yeah, I, I understand. Okay. So the output of Wasabi was a .NET assembly, mm-hmm. and you want to change it to an output proper C Sharp. Yes. You haven't quite got Roslyn yet. Roslyn is the open source and memory .NET compiler that we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But you don't quite have the tools that you need. You don't have compiler as a service. You're still messing around with strings at this point. Yeah. So we were using, for our .NET backend for Wasabi 3, we were using a technology called um, Microsoft Code DOM, mm-hmm. which is very, it's weird. It's a very weird <laughs> concept. So it was a good the, idea at the time. Yeah. I mean, it almost, almost it, a good idea at the time. <laughs> it was an idea at the time. It, it was, certainly did things. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm convinced it was a good idea, but it was an idea and it was done. It was not the so idea we, we deserved, but it was the idea we had. Yeah. The idea was that they would have basically an abstract syntax tree that you could programmatically generate, and then it would be able to compile to either C Sharp mm-hmm. or Visual Basic.net, the same AST. Mm-hmm. And what that meant was there was no way to do things that were not possible in one of those languages. Right. So the idea of idiomatic stuff then suddenly becomes a problem. Right. Yeah. And it... It was really focused on generating code that was not meant to be read. It was just made to generate code that could be compiled, period. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I never really figured out how to do the not operator in code DOM. Instead, what you would do is you would compare your Boolean expression with false. So instead of saying not y, you would say y equals equals false. Hmm. And that happens... A little bit in fog bugs <laughs> where we want to negate values. Yeah. The same thing with negative numbers. You'd have to subtract the number from zero. So, so instead of negative 30, it would be zero minus 30 okay. with, with parentheses around every single sub expression in an expression because it didn't right. care about any of that stuff. 
So it worked though. And it got Fogbugs onto .NET and off of VBScript and off of PHP, which gave us a huge performance boost because we were no longer in these interpreted languages. Is the source still at this point still Wasabi, or at this point did you actually, you know, check like remove all of the Wasabi files and you were only on C Sharp? We were still working in Wasabi at that point, and it took until 2015 for us to remove the Wasabi source. Okay, so you're still not at this point in the story. We're still not there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Roslyn, internally at Microsoft, there was a project that was called The Big Switch. Mm -hmm. And The Big Switch was when we, I think it was about a year and a half ago. I can look online. They they did a blog post. It was the moment when we built, went from building everything with the original C-sharp compiler to building to Roslyn. And there were all these emails that happened internally that were like, okay, get ready. The Big Switch is going to be flipped. You know, in in a moment, we're going to flip The Big Switch. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, you know, it was a big deal because you needed nothing to break, right? You're, you're doing a brain transplant while the patient is walking around and talking about stuff. Yes. I had so you had a similar situation. A very similar situation. It's a much smaller and slower patient, I think, because <laughs> uh, it was just fog bugs. It wasn't these huge multi-billion dollar lines of business like Microsoft has. Mm-hmm. But it was still kind of scary. I mean, we had pretty pretty good levels of trust because I did it in several phases. So starting in about February is when I started um, re, you know, changing the build process just slightly. So the first thing we did was we made um, MS build generate just C sharp files mm-hmm. from Wasabi, which was always a capability it had. It just we never did it because the output was so unreadably bad. Um, but that was the first step was I just had it generate C sharp files and then called MS build to say, hey, here are the C sharp files that make fog bugs. Can you build this, please? Mm-hmm. Um, and I fixed a bug where we were generating a bunch of unused labels just because I was in there. And then I created a new mercurial, mercurial repository and checked in that output. And so that was my baseline of Roslyn output. And then I copied the, or not Roslyn, sorry, code DOM output. Mm-hmm. So I took the code DOM output and I started writing a Roslyn generator based on code DOM. And every time I made a fix to the Roslyn generator, I would check it into that repository and diff against the first revision to see how much more work I had left to do. Mm -hmm. So it started, Fogbugs is almost a million lines of code. It started with about 1.5 million lines of difference. Mm. So three quarters of the output was just wrong in some way or not matching exactly what code dump said. Will you also answer indirectly there that my kind of one of my questions, my kind of ongoing question, which is, why don't you just write this whole thing over again? Oh, it's a million lines of code. Yes, that is that so is something. This that isn't we, just some crud application that just throws some bugs into a table. It's a big deal. Yeah, Fogbugs is a huge application. Um, it has a email processing portion. It has a wiki. It has evidence based scheduling, which is very complicated. It has a plugin architecture so that you could build a plugin that does basically anything because it's, you know, you're writing programs and, you know, there's just lots and lots and lots of code. Um, and some of that is because Wasabi had a feature that would write code for you, mm-hmm. but C sharp, we don't have that. So I just generated it directly. And so there's 60,000 lines of code just right there for our database access layer. Wow. So, Roslyn, the big switch happens internally. Roslyn becomes a thing that can really be used. Mm-hmm. You've identified it. If you've been, were you on the cutting edge? Were you using Roslyn when it wasn't quite baked? Because we just kind of like, quote unquote, released it, you know, a couple of months ago. Yeah. I don't think it was, I don't think it was a, a full, I don't remember what version I was using, but it definitely said something like beta or pre release on the NuGet package that I had installed in Wasabi. Mm-hmm. And you didn't think anything of it? No problem? It's fine. I mean, I was I was looking at the output. We have a lot of code, and if something doesn't work, I'm going to notice it pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and we use source control because we are modern developers from the 2000s, and we understand that if you make a mistake, you can always go back. So that's how we kind of developed um, a trust in the tool. Um, was March 4th was when I finally checked in 
the output from Rosalind and I ran mm-hmm. HT diff and it printed nothing. Did you believe that it was possible that you had done it correctly? Yeah, because I had done two and a half weeks of work to get to that point. Okay. <laughs> like so there was no question when that happened. It was more, it wasn't like a sense of disbelief. It was a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, it was, it was more of a, oh, finally, I can't believe it that I did this, but uh-huh. I can believe that it's done because I don't want to not believe that anymore. So what about your original goal from the very, very beginning of this conversation, which is those 10% of people who want to run it on Linux? They can still run it on Linux. I mean, we write it in C Sharp. We compile it to a DLL, and mm-hmm. then you run that DLL on Mono, and it works as well as Mono does. Cool. So so Mono works great for this, and you found Mono to do its job fine. Because some people have said that maybe Mono isn't good for production. It's it's not the environment we run Fogbugs on, so we don't get to dog food it very much. Mm-hmm. So our in-house Fogbugs instance is called r.fogbugs.com. Mm-hmm. And that's running on Windows, of course. Um, so we don't run on Mono our business. So we, we definitely sure. don't have so much trust in that. But what I'm saying is that you haven't had any issues. People haven't been saying, oh, yeah, this randomly has a problem or, you know, the core dump here or there. I don't know. It's I have no experience running <laughs> Mono in production. I, I'm not trying to slander Mono in any way. I think it's great. I think it's nice to hear that as Microsoft goes off and writes a core CLR, <laughs> and the, which I assume that you will target at some point, and then you'll switch running fog bugs over the core CLR when it could possibly do that. <laughs> um, Mono's been working great for you for what sounds like some years. Yeah. Well, we're not using the tip of Mono. That's that's the kind of scary thing, is that we have a fork from basically 2010, hmm. and we've been maintaining that and keeping that running. and. That is a little concerning. Yeah. Um, just because it is such a large volume of work to get it to the latest version. I see. So and switching to whatever mono is in 2015 from the personally maintained fork, it would be non-trivial. Yes. That would actually be more work than the work I did to switch from code down to Rosalind. But, but every day that goes by puts you farther and farther away. Yeah. And we and have you, fewer and, and fewer and, Linux customers. Yeah, and so then does that mean that the core CLR running on Linux reliably is your only out at this point? That would relieve the pressure of having to support Mono, yeah. Uh-huh. Have you run it on the core CLR yet and seen what works and what doesn't? Not yet. I should try that. That would be an... We'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like something that would be your next big project, wouldn't it? Because that would mean you could refactor via subtraction, where you would simply subtract your own personal branch of mono and not have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, and that's something personally I'm the best at is my most productive days are the days when I delete some huge component that mm-hmm. is now implemented by two lines of library code. It's just part of .NET now and I can say, mm-hmm. oh, I don't need this anymore. We've got lambdas in C Sharp. Why was that? You know, why are we generating these magic um, lambda classes in Wasabi? Um I can see here on my calendar, March 11th, it just says lambdas. And I know that that means that's the day I turned them into C-sharp lambdas. <laughs> and it deleted probably 10,000 lines of code to be able to do that. Nice. So you also uh, released Wasabi's new code generator mm-hmm. as open source, which is cool. Yeah, it's on GitHub. And you said that you, and I don't know if this is true, but I think it's true. You said that this is probably the first real world transpiler that targets C-sharp with Roslyn that's been open-sourced. I don't know if that's true either, but I haven't seen any counterexamples. Well, this is the opportunity for people to come out and call you out. Yeah. It seems pretty cool. Yeah. It is a very significant code generator, though. We are using it. We did use it to convert fog bugs um, from a code dom lifestyle to just being a C-sharp application. Mm-hmm. And is a, it's an MVC app, or what is it? Uh... It's just a library. Um, it's actually a console application right now, but it, it generates a single piece of code that I think returns zero from a function called main. <laughs> is that what it is? Okay. Uh, and the, But the code that it generates, though, was uh, Fogbugs itself is an ASP.NET app? It is an ASP.NET app, yeah. We don't use MVC. In- so it's using your own flavor of handlers and modules. And exactly. It, right. is, it, it is its own thing. It is VB script for the 2015 
set. That is, you just, yeah, by the way, that is now the title of this show. I've just decided. Great. Phoebe script for 2015. I'm Fog stuck with this technology looks, forever. Fog Creek looks to the future. <laughs> Fog Creek the, looks to the two decades and ago. The, and the future is Phoebe script for. So what do you think that people will use with this code? We use this code on, on uh, GitHub. Is this for education or for bootstrapping their own work? Maybe they have similar problems and they don't even realize that there's a way out. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of just a signpost to say this is how I did it and these are the challenges that I worked around in this way. Mm -hmm. So if they if if somebody wants to look at it and say, Man, I just really need to write a .NET language right now, mm -hmm. they can look at my back end and see how I did it using Roslyn instead of hand rolling their own with printf. You've got in here an importer, a lexer, a parser, an interpreter, a type checker, all of the different things available. So uh, you could probably teach a class on this stuff if you wanted to, couldn't you? I could. I've actually given a 30-minute talk called Let's Build a Compiler in 30 Minutes in JavaScript. Seriously? Yeah. And that's on my GitHub is the source code for that compiler. It's very, very simple. It has four loops, and that's it. But we did it in 30, I think 32 minutes because we stopped for a question and debugging session in the middle. Uh-huh. But it has a lexer, which takes characters and turns them into tokens, also called a tokenizer. It has a parser, which takes those and builds a syntax tree. It has a generator, which takes that syntax tree and prints out JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, people, I will take the uh, links, by the way, to your talk, to your GitHub, and put it all in the show notes so that people can go and explore this code and check it out, as well as your two very good uh, blog posts up on Fog Creek called Killing Off Wasabi, mm -hmm. parts one and two. Are there going to be more parts? Is this an ongoing saga that we should follow? <laughs> I think Wasabi is pretty well in debt at this point, at okay, least for good. fog bugs. Very cool. Well, thanks for chatting with me today. Thanks for having me. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. We'll see you again next week. 